uh, first of the two sessions for lighting talks and uh, featured oral presentation. The first paper is from Jerome. Uh, Jerome, I see you, I saw you around. So if you could please start sharing your screen. I'm yes, so that. can you guys hear me first? Yes. Is the absolutely. sound clear? Yes. Great. So let me share my Oh, Jerome, screen. sorry, while you share your screen, um, please, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Isaac Johnson um, is going to monitor the chat for uh, questions and for people who want to open their mic and, and ask questions. So, And with that, uh, Jerome, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for being here. What a great responsibility to be kicking off this, this amazing workshop. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna try and do today is to quickly tell you a story about Wikipedia governance that most of you know very well already, but I'm gonna tell you this story uh, using an experiment which is, a, uh, I think, a very efficient way to uh, convey those kind of stories. Uh, this is a programmatic paper, so I'm very excited that we have many, many students around uh, because I think that there is a job to be done uh, in, in, in this space. So um, this uh, paper is about trust and community policing. Uh, let me directly dive in. What's the motivation for it? Uh, the motivation for it is pretty simple. We know that Wikipedia as a peer production community relies on its ability to attract and retain volunteers to thrive. And uh, there is a puzzle that has been attracting uh, the attention of researchers on Wikimedia projects for some time is that for most uh, mature uh, communities on Wikipedia, the number of active contributors has been plateauing for about a decade so that uh, projects have difficulties uh, attracting and retaining volunteers, especially from mi minority groups uh, or, or, or female. And so people have been trying to look into the reasons uh, for, for this problem, right? In, in extending uh, the community. And there's a lot of research on this that basically points to the increasing bureaucratization uh, of Wikipedia and the impersonal or extensive enforcement of uh, policies aimed at protecting the encyclopedia from malicious users. Um, and so uh, really the implicit assumption of all of this line of work is that admins, but also experienced users uh, do not strike the right balance between the inclusion of good faith actors and the exclusion of malicious ones. Or another way to say this is that there is substantial heterogeneity in the way administrators exercise their policing rights that is not grounded in hard information, which leads to inefficient policy. Based on this assumption, a few papers, actually, you know, those can be counted uh, uh, with only one hand, try to design classifiers and tools aimed at helping administrators and experienced users reach better community policy decisions so that you can extract this information, this textual information from Wikipedia. Now, um, I said, as I said, uh, this uh, is a very thin stream of research and whether you think that this line of research is warranted or not, really depends on whether you buy this implicit assumption uh, that there is inefficient policing uh, going on on Wikipedia. And that is a hypothesis that's very hard to test because uh, the decision problem that administrators typically have to solve is very hard. They operate under time pressure with limited information that may be costly to acquire, and they need to jointly minimize the risk of failing to react to harmful behavior while uh, trying not to exercise their policy right on good faith editors and not driving them away from the community. Now, this is difficult to demonstrate that administrators get this problem wrong. Uh, and so what this paper is going to try to do is to tackle this question um, using, uh, using the concept of decision-making heuristics. So what this paper is going to do is that it's going to provide a direct test of the ID that Wikipedia administrators rely on inefficient decision-making heuristics when they make their community policy decisions. 
what is a decision-making heuristic? There's a huge literature on this in psychology. Um, basically, when the environment is complex, you're acting uh, in, uh, under uncertainty. Uh, people rely on simplifying decision-making rules uh, that allow them to reach decisions uh, quickly, but may also be costly in terms of, effic of efficiency because uh, the, the criterion they're used uh, may be unrelated to the problem at hand. And so what we're going to focus here in the context of this paper is uh, trust as a social heuristics, trust in strangers as social heuristics that develops early on in people's lives, depending on the way they socialize or institutions. And we think that trust in strangers is very relevant to community policy, especially Wikipedia, which is committed to openness and uh, attracts contributions from anonymous users, right? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to test the hypothesis that general trust attitudes in the admin population that are mostly acquired out of Wikipedia influence the community policy decisions of administrators. And we're going to estimate the extent to which this is the case. And that is going to provide us with a test of whether the decision making process of administrators in Wikipedia actually is efficient or relies on unrelated heuristics. OK, so this is really a test of the implicit assumption of the efficiency of the decision making process of Wikipedia administrators. As I said, um, we're going to do this using an experiment. Trust is very difficult to measure in a decontextualized way. And so we're going to rely on a large literature that does this using experiments. So about nine years ago, uh, 120 Wikipedia administrators played a trust game online, which is uh, a behavioral economics game that's widely used in the literature to do this. And that, uh, that was advertised on Wikipedia through a site notice. And we're going to use this experimental measure of trust to try and predict admin activity over six months to nine years. And the more we see the link there, uh, the more we will conclude that administrators actually uh, uh, have substantial heterogeneity in the way they exercise it for their policy right, which is not justified. And by definition, would lead to inefficient policy. OK. Uh, just uh, a couple of words on the experiment. How does this experiment work? Um, we basically uh, divide the population of administrators in the study in two. Uh, we have participant A's and participant B's. Both of them are endowed with $10 at the beginning of the experiment. But participant A has a decision to make. So that guy over here. He can decide to send whatever fraction of his endowment from 0 to $10 to participant B. Whatever he decides to send is tripled by the experimenter. So if he decides to send everything, then participant B will receive $30. Participant B at this stage has a decision to make how much to return to participant A. But he cannot communicate nor commit to do anything. So that because this is a one-shot interaction that's totally anonymous, the amount that participant A will be willing to risk sending to participant B is typically interpreted as a measure of trust in anonymous strangers. And this is really what we care about here, right? We care about administrators having to police uh, a lot of users they have very limited information about, if anything. Okay? So, this is the trust game that uh, administrators play, and we're going to focus here on the behavior of participant A's, which are the trusters, so to speak. Okay, so uh, we're going to collect this trust variable here um, for the population we're interested in. This uh, variable ranges from zero, you send nothing, to one, you send your whole endowment to that stranger, and that's our measure of trust, experimental measure of trust. We also collect a bunch of control variables where uh, your age, your gender, your degree level, level of risk aversion, plus uh, one more variable, which is uh, the level of main space activity of those administrators, because we don't want to confuse policing activities with main space edits, regular edits, as those two might be correlated. Okay, so we're going to control for that too in the model. So those are the, the, the basically the explanatory variables of the model we're interested in. And we're going to try, as I say, to predict uh, community policing decisions in this population. So we're going to have the number of users blocked over 
nine years after the experiment, the number of pages they, the, that administrators delete, the number of pages they protect, uh, the overall count of the admin actions they perform, uh, and also this is a six month measure, uh, the last one here, self-reported time, fraction of their time that admins uh, report uh, um, dedicating to admin activities. So this is a, a survey measure that we ask administrators six months after the experiment, which is why uh, N is a little bit lower here in the response rate, okay? And so basically here is the results of the test. Uh, so those are simple OLS regressions. Each column here corresponds to a dependent variable as defined in this table, right? That we just talked about. So this is the community policing activities of our administrators, right? As a function of trust, age, gender, degree level risk aversion, and your main space activity level. Um, I'm not gonna comment in the interest of time on the control variables, but basically what we see here is that trust is the variable that's most strongly associated with community policy decisions on Wikipedia, right? So for instance, here, what you see here, if you focus on the number of users that administrators block, moving from no trust to full trust, is associated, this coefficient is about, uh, if you compute it, precisely 80% reduction in the number of users that administrators decide to block. When you move from no trust in strangers to full trust in strangers in this uh, decontextualized experiment. And you see the same thing for the number of pages deleted, the number of admin actions overall, and also for the self-reported time that administrators declare uh, dedicating to admin activities. Again, this is all controlling for the level of main space uh, edits, so that we see this very strong relationship between generalized trust and admin activities that suggests that in fact, the uh, implicit assumption of those few papers that try to use the, uh, the, the great textual resource that's Wikipedia to build classifiers and tools aimed at guiding administrators in their community policy decision is very much warranted. Uh, so I think this is a very exciting area of research moving forward for Wikimedia researchers uh, that, 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 we should, that we should think about are the building of those tools that's going to that's gonna help uh, administrators and experienced editors uh, reach more efficient community policy decisions in the world in which we see them acting based on heuristics because uh, of uncertainty, time pressure, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, hopefully, I wasn't too long and uh, take questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this presentation. In the interest of time, um, since we are a little bit over time, um, would it be OK if we ask um, participants to type the question in the chat and you reply uh, over chat and we move to the next presenter? Anyway, there will be a post session at the end where you will be able to discuss with everyone. Apologies, um, I think we are in a, on a very tight schedule. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, Sneha, you're next, uh, I think. Hello. Hello. Uh, can you yeah. share your screen, please? Yes, yes, I will do that. So Sneha is going to tell us about um, languages of knowledge infrastructure, learning from research on Indian language Wikimedia projects. Uh, so a very different perspective. We can see your screens now, half. please go ahead. And the floor is yours. Right, hi everyone, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, thanks so much. And uh, it's so great to be here as part of this uh, workshop. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit today about uh, some of the research that we've been doing at the Center for Internet and Society, the Access to Knowledge Program. Uh, my name is Sneha. I'm a researcher. I work uh, primarily on digital media and cultures. With the Wikipedia or the Access to Knowledge team at CIS, uh, I've largely been supervising and managing a series of research projects. Uh, short-term, small studies, because this is a very initial foray for us into 
uh, research on Wikimedia projects uh, and platforms. So just to quickly move on, this is just a very quick introductory slide on CIS. We're a nonprofit organization based in Bangalore and Delhi in India. Uh, we work largely on policy research uh, related to various uh, aspects of the internet, but also some academic research on digital media and cultures, open access, digital knowledge, etc. And of course, we support and work very closely with the Indian language Wikimedia communities. Um, the program itself is called Access to Knowledge. Um, and of course, our objective is to catalyze and support the growth of the open knowledge movement in South Asia. Uh, in Indic languages, and uh, these are all the many ways in which we've been uh, working with, with communities, supporting and serving Indian Wikimedia communities, building partnerships, bringing more content under free licenses, um, working on community participation, and supporting volunteers um, through, you know, uh, through various uh, sort of projects and uh, plans. So to to get to the research that, that we've been doing over the last two years. So this actually began as sort of a pilot initiative as a very initial foray in 2019. And this was based, of course, on foundation feedback to tap into existing research expertise that's available at CIS and also to sort of diversify the areas of work that the Access to Knowledge program has been engaged with. Um, of course, uh, our uh, immediate and our uh, sort of larger objective was to definitely be attentive, and still is very much, to be very attentive to community needs and priorities. Um, so the projects themselves were sort of very short-term, small-scale projects undertaken by team members. Um, you can see the names of the projects and the various team members who have worked on these projects over the course of the last, um, say, year and a half, two years almost. Um, so the idea was really to have, you know, still have sort of an ear to the ground and really sort of pick up needs and priorities and areas of work uh, from the work that we've been doing uh, with communities over the last uh, six, seven years. Easily. So uh, just to kind of very uh, quickly go through the projects, uh, we've had a long standing thematic on um, uh, called Bridging the Gender Gap in Indian language communities. So there are a series of programmatic activities that we undertake, working closely with um, Wikipedia communities and uh, with groups, uh, user groups who've been working closely on the issue of the gender gap in Indian language communities. So, and of course, as part of that, we've also done um, previously as well, a series of studies on analyzing and understanding the prevalence of the gender gap um, what are sort of content participation related um, challenges, issues, what have been efforts undertaken by different communities and uh, how does the problem also sort of evolve and change and what are possible strategies and solutions, right? So this year again, we undertook such an exercise. Um, that report is available and published on the CIS website and also on uh, Meta. Uh, there's a study on mapping um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums in Maharashtra. This is undertaken by Subodh Kulkarni. So this is again looking at what kind of glam content is available across uh, various institutions in Maharashtra in Marathi, which is the, the main official language of the state. And uh, we've been trying to also understand what have been challenges in digitizing and making this content available, right? So technical challenges, legal challenges related to open access, licenses, etc. Another project was on uh, data gaps on heritage structures in West Bengal. So uh, where have been, where have these projects struggled with trying to uh, put up complete data, complete sort of structured linked data on cultural heritage structures on Wikidata? What have been challenges related to resources, uh, documentation, and eventually sort of getting that content onto Wikidata and uh, linked in such a way that they're discoverable? Right. Um, another study on content creation on Eastern Punjabi Wikipedia. So what is the nature of content that presently exists? What have been challenges with um, translation specifically? And uh, how, what have been strategies and efforts in creating new content specifically related to the state of Punjab and uh, its various aspects on this Wikipedia? There's also a case study on a long running project um, in Karnataka, in Bangalore, in fact. 
uh, with Christ University. So there's a Wikipedia and education program that uh, CIC2K has been engaged with for easily about seven years now. And uh, this was an opportune time for us to also do a case study to understand how that program has evolved, what have been um, changes, what have been strategies, what have been sort of um, issues with uh, digital learning, right? So how have digital learning and pedagogic strategies also evolved with the introduction of Wikipedia in the classroom? Um, there's also now a study on article creation campaigns on Wikimedia. So this is a mapping of the Wikipedia Asian Month and Project Tiger, two content creation uh, projects uh, that have been undertaken. Um, Wikipedia Asian Month, of course, has been going on since 2015, if I recall correctly, uh, correctly. and uh, Project Tiger is about two years old. So this is a sort of comparative analysis undertaken by both these researchers who have also worked closely with these projects. Um, these are the last two are, of course, new. Um, one is, of course, a new project, and the last one is a research needs assessment exercise that we've just recently completed. So again, uh, building on the GLAM work, uh, an effort to map content on water resources in Maharashtra and how much of this is available in Indian languages, uh, where are they right now available, and how to bring them online and onto platforms like Wikipedia. Right? So the research needs assessment, I will talk about a little bit more um, as we move on uh, to tell you a little bit about our learnings from even from this mapping and how we understand um, uh, what, what is the understanding of research among Indian Wikipedia communities as well? So, right, so just quickly to also talk a little bit about methods uh, that we've used in these various studies, uh, six, seven of them. So methods have included interviews, um, desk research, surveys, data visualization, like in the case of the Wikidata um, project, uh, so it, it's been a mix of traditional, non-traditional methods because the researchers themselves are also active Wikipedia volunteers, team members, and, and bring their own sort of understanding of working with the communities to the research. So we've kept it quite sort of flexible, open, um, but also, you know, maintaining that sort of rigor in the research design in terms of the kind of qualitative aspects of, uh, of the study. So uh, just... Uh, to quickly go through some of the broad observations from the projects that we have completed so far. Uh, out of these, uh, we've completed one, two, three, four, yeah. So I think four of uh, the first five are done and uh, the study on Wikimedia and education was also uh, very quickly, will shortly be available uh, online. Um, so I think these are sort of broad observations, uh, content gaps, Definitely still a large array of content in Indian languages that remains unavailable for wider public access. Digitization being a major challenge, translation being again um, a major challenge, and awareness and implementation of open access policies, again being a barrier to this. Uh, knowledge disparities, so lack of technological, infrastructural, and policy-related knowledge. So again, understanding of open access policies, for instance, copyright, um, which again sort of create and exacerbate, exacerbate uh, disparities in content creation, in access and use. Uh, diversity in content and participation. So uh, BGG, which is the acronym for Bridging the Gender Gap, is a reflection precisely of this, this persistent uh, question that we've come across you know, for, for several years now um, of content and participation gaps. Um, again, participation, participation not only by women, but individuals across the spectrum of gender and sexual identities, uh, which affect the sort of comprehensive picture of knowledge that is produced on Wikipedia, right? So, um, so a lot of interesting and, and difficult questions that have come up uh, in the course of that, that study. Capacity building, I think, uh, comes up as one of the big sort of areas of work and um, sort of interesting questions also as part of you know, the research kind of foray that we've done. Um, there's a need for training and awareness in uh, technological skills, communication skills, um, understanding media, so social media, for instance, community health and policy related aspects. Um, so even in the research needs assessment exercise, for instance, um, a lot of uh, people who responded to that study actually said that, you know, technological, uh, understanding technological aspects of Wikipedia still remains kind of an area of work, uh, translation tools, um, understanding data-related aspects, um, you know, policy definitely, I think, 
you know, better understanding of open access and uh, Creative Commons licenses, for instance. I think all these remain sort of areas of work. So technological aspects, uh, community building aspects again. So community health policies related to community interaction, um, process related aspects. I think these are again areas that came up as areas of research or research that community members would like to see. Right. Um, process related learnings and challenges were many because this was again uh -huh. for us. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we are going a little bit over time with with this presentation. Oh. Uh, it's super interesting. I would I will hear your presentation, but you know we have a very tight schedule. If you don't mind wrapping up, and then you can go for questions in the chat. Would that be okay? Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. We'll do. We'll do. Yes. Just give me two minutes. I'm just going to leave this slide here with the last set of sort of reflections and questions. Um, again, on Wikipedia as a knowledge infrastructure. Uh, reconciling local and global priorities, uh, looking at replicability Sneha, and transfer. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I need to interrupt. Uh, we unfortunately can't give the two minutes uh, because the lightning talks oh, are quite packed. So if you can wrap this up within the next 20 seconds, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to end here. I'm just going to leave the slide for uh, questions. If there are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha, and apologies. Uh, we have a very, you know, we have so many submissions to this workshop that we have a very packed schedule and every single one would deserve an entire workshop by itself. But so unfortunately we have to go on. All right, so uh, Lucy, I hope you're ready for the first item talk. This is going to be a very, um, how to say, hectic section. We're gonna have nine presentation in 27 minutes. And I'm going to show you the slides and I'm going to go through the slide if I find them. Um, yes, they're here. All right. Uh, this is, yes. All right. Yes, Lucy? Yeah. Um, beginning? Okay, perfect. So, I will very quickly and briefly talk about references on Wikipedia from an editor's perspective. It's work I did together with Hadi et Saha, who's also in the workshop. Meet us later in the lightning session, poster sessions. Next slide. Um, I can't see the next slide. <laughs> okay, so- um, Apologies, it's stuck. Uh, so I okay, I'll, I'll tell you okay. in the this, meantime. This one, right? So we did interviews, it's one before that. Um, we did interviews and a survey, and basically we wanted to find out um, how editors create articles with a focus on referencing. This is basically the workflow we found. There's a selection of topic process, there's a reference selection process, and they structure articles. Uh, we have all the information, the paper has all the information, you should read it, but also talk to us. And the next slide, finally, uh, just some points we wanted to highlight that 11% of editors in Wikipedia across different languages that we interviewed do not use any tools for finding references. 5% uh, of people only use offline references such as books, but there is 11% use online and offline references, meaning there's a large margin of people using online references. How do they use online references is super interesting. As I said, more detail somewhere else, but uh, we found that uh, features or like interesting parts for using an online reference or selecting it is accessibility, such as paywalls. It's important that uh, content is open, accessible, uh, the availability towards low resource languages and the quality um, of the reference that often is uh, inferred by looking at how often it's used on previous Wikipedia. And that's it for me. Uh, we'll see you Thank all you, in Lucy. the poster session later. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Hiba. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, this is a brief uh, overview of our paper on negative knowledge for open world Wikidata. Uh, I'm Hiba, PhD student at Max Planck Institute, and this work is part of a research project on negative knowledge at web scale. For more about the project, please follow us on Twitter at Negation and Knowledge Bases. Uh, next, please. 
So querying Wikidata about the awards of uh, Stephen Hawking will return 42 awards that he has won. One salient award that he has not won, however, is the Nobel Prize in Physics. Existing positive-only knowledge bases are unaware of such negations because they operate under the open word assumption, which means that if a statement is not asserted in the knowledge base, it is not necessarily false. So for Wikidata, this is an unknown statement, when in reality it is false. Uh, next, please. So we're, what we're proposing is to explicitly add interesting negative statements to Wikidata and other open word knowledge bases. The main problem here is how are we going to identify what an interesting negation is. To do so, we propose the peer-based negation inference methodology. We aim to discover interesting negations about an entity by observing highly related entities. For Stephen Hawking, for example, related entities, which are mostly other physicists, will lead us to the expectation that he probably should have won the Nobel Prize in Physics. And using uh, the completeness assumption over parts of the knowledge base, or what we call peer groups, with a, a ranking model, we are able to decide that this inference is interesting and likely correct. Uh, to showcase the methodology, we present the Wikinegata platform, which you can visit uh, using the displayed link. I will also paste all the links in the chat afterwards. It's a platform for browsing salient negations about Wikidata entities. It can be explored using two interfaces. Through entity summarization, you can give an entity uh, as, as a query, for, for example, Leonardo DiCaprio, and then get interesting negations about him, such as uh, he has no children. You can explore his peers on the side, play with different peering functions, as well as other features. The second application is question answering, where you can give negative triple pattern as a query. For example, give me people who have no, not received the Nobel Prize in Physics, and you receive a list of ranked entities who were highly inferred not to have won this award. I would like to invite you to visit the platform, visit the paper to know more about the methodology, and follow us on Twitter. Uh, thanks, and see you at the poster session, rule number two for knowledge graphs. Thank you. Thank you, Hiba. Uh, Anton, you're next. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Ankur Khushdostitar from Bangladesh, and I'm delighted to be with you in Wiki Workshop 2021, although virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to present my paper, A Brief Analysis of Bengali Wikipedia's Journey to 100,000 Articles. Uh, I will uh, turn off my video to make sure that you all can hear me properly. Okay, so Bengali Wikipedia started its journey on January 2004, and after almost 17 years, it crossed the milestone of 100,000 articles. In this paper, a brief overview of this journey has been presented by inspecting various parameters and also looking at the gender gap condition. The motivation behind this study was to have a brief reflection of various sectors of Bengali Wikipedia, its improvement and lackings in this journey of 17 years, not to go deeper with any certain topic, which can be part of our future work. So in this journey, various parameters, including active editor, new content creation rate, et cetera, have improved quite a bit. And the stats are really encouraging. As you can see here in the past few years, its growth rate has been quite promising with a notable growth, especially since 2019. Some peaks in the graph, as you can see in the uh, last portions, the recent peaks, uh, reflect the impact of various events like article contests, uh, some large scale editathon. And so we can understand that these events are really having an impact and motivating newcomers. But not every event, uh, despite being an important, uh, despite being important for the encyclopedia, can show such impact. In this study, I have also explored the editing behavior of users, and I have not uh, included those since I need to keep this short. And I have found that Bengali Wikipedia stands in the topmost position among the active editor community who use mobile for editing purpose among the Wikimedia projects. Next slide, please. However, a huge gender gap exists in the worldwide movement, as we all know, and also it is quite prevalent in our community. In Bengali Wikipedia, it has been analyzed in several ways in this study, and let me share some of them. In the 2019 to 20 timeline, 7.41% uh, users among the registered users expressed their gender as female, which was 3.69% in 2010 to 11. It has improved in a really sluggish manner if you compare it with other parameters like active editor growth or content creation growth. Therefore, it leaves an unequal condition in the Bengali Wiki. We know that uh, users are permitted various rights depending on their experience and expertise. 
I have analyzed users with various rights and they are the number of female contributors ranges from zero to 5% at best. In the Indic language, Wikipedia considering at least 500 registration on the 19 to 20 timeline, Bengali Wikipedia stands in the lowest position as you can see here. Uh, I believe this study to be helpful for the organizers and everyone concerned to reduce the gaps and work accordingly. And so that's all for this lightning talk. If you have any question, feel free to reach out to me at room one in the community perspective subsession, and you can reach out to me anytime through my email. Thank you. Thank you so much, and Khan. Um, Nasser, I believe you're next. Yes. Hello, I am Nasser Ahmadi, and we'll present our paper, uh, Wikidata Logical Rules and Where to Find Them. Uh, next. Uh, in the current uh, version, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Wikidata uses a property constraint to define restrictions on data. These constraints are uh, syntactic checks, and, then, uh, and uh, they, can, they are defined over uh, properties values to make sure that uh, some restrictions are applied. For example, as you can see in, the, in this picture, a constraint is defined to, the de to uh, declare that uh, uh, native language can only have one value. Right now, there are more than 8,000 of these constraints defined in uh, Wikidata. Our goal uh, in, in this paper is to use logical rules to curate Wikidata. Logical rules are more uh, expressive than uh, this constraint, and they can be used to apply more complicated restric uh, restriction. Uh, logical rules can be positive or negative. We can use uh, logical rule, uh, rules to apply constraints like a subject uh, cannot be married to an object uh, who died before, uh, before the birth date of the subject, or if a, an object is the doctor student of the subject, then the subject is the advisor of the object. Uh, positive uh, logical rules can be used for adding missing facts to knowledge graphs. Uh, for example, by applying the, the positive rules that we had here, we can add uh, 25 new triples uh, to uh, Wikidata. On the other hand, uh, negative rules uh, can be used to uh, find errors and uh, inconsistencies uh, in knowledge graphs. And uh, in the example here, we can find 689 <clears throat> inconsistencies uh, in Wikidata. There are some other examples in the table that you can see. Uh, manually crafting uh, these logical rules are um, uh, very difficult. And for this reason, uh, in the next slide, we propose two automatic methods uh, to, uh, to mine these rules uh, from Wikidata. Uh, the first method, in the first method, we use a rule miner named uh, Rudik to, uh, to directly go to Wikidata and uh, extract positive and uh, negative rules. Here you can see a, an example of a rule um, that has been uh, extracted using Rudik. And uh, this rule states that uh, if a, a subject and object, they have a, a child in common, then uh, they should be in a, in a spouse relationship. In the second method, we translate uh, rules that are already mined from uh, DBpedia, and uh, these rules are stored in, a, in the database named uh, RuleHub, and uh, we translate these rules uh, into Wikidata format. For example, uh, with this method, we could uh, generate uh, a rule that you already saw in the, in the previous slide, and uh, uh, this rule was uh, translated from a rule uh, that, uh, that has been mined uh, from uh, DBpedia. The biggest challenge that we have to overcome in continuing our project is the uncertain nature of, uh, of most of the rules. There are only a few number of rules that are always true in, uh, in all situations, and uh, most of the rules they do, do not hold in all cases. For example, uh, the positive rule that you can see in this slide, uh, it's not true always, and uh, there can be some uh, people that they have a uh, child in common, or they are not uh, in a spouse relationship. Or even an, uh, a very strong rule uh, like a country has only uh, one capital has uh, 15 exceptions. For solving, uh, for solving this problem, uh, we assign a confidence score to each rule, uh, which shows how accurate the rule is. Our evaluations, as you can see in the, in, in the plot in this slide, show that uh, the proposed confidence me measure has a very good correlation with a, a manually computed uh, confidence uh, by human. The problem uh, is that uh, these uncertain rules, uh, they cannot be used to uh, to clean Wikidata, and we have to uh, uh, we have to convert these rules into exact rules. And uh, so, uh, for solving this challenge right now, we uh, we are thinking about three so, uh, solutions: adding uh, conditions to rules, or add exceptions to rules, uh, or uh, using a human in the loop. Thanks a lot, and please visit us uh, in the room too. Thank you, Nasser. Tony, you're next. Hello, hello from Barcelona. Okay, so thanks for the opportunity to share with you a bit of this work. Uh, it's a very preliminary work as a disclaimer. So uh, let me put you a bit of the motivations. Uh, in my real work, I'm a bioinformatician, but in my daily uh, contributor time, I want to uh, 
he contributed, let's say, improving the quality of different biographies. And with this sense, Wikidata and authorities are very important. And at the same time, to, to, to handle, to, to try to reduce the gap regarding the, the gender the gender bias we have in biography, that you know that it's, it's still very prevalent in different Wikipedias. No, I already share with you a link so you can see some of the reports and results. So just briefly, let me show you a bit of how this works. For most of you that are already working with data, you have all these problematics. No, how you handle with this? Okay, so the situation simply for uh, for another, the idea was trying to have a kind of very live thing, very very quick thing to to have very uh, very many times a day, so we can get things from Wikidata for five times per week. And also in relation to templates, it is something that it's very related to want to see if the biographies have, let's say, templates regarding lack of references or uh, problems of, uh, let's say, notability, et cetera. I think it's something you can do very quite quite often, but for things like authorities and other kind of stuff, you have to refer to the dumps. Yeah? So this is something that you, you have to do. Weekly, no, and of course, for this, we are using a, wiki, a database to keep it uh, all together, so you have to rerun things many times, no, and pandas for making it all together. And we put in, and that's the thing that I, I want to uh, stress put everything in the same wikis in some specific namespace, so the final users or activists that want to handle these things can find them. So, next, next slide. So kind of the results that the idea, as I commend you, is try to get an engagement of people to solve some of these, is try to see uh, generating lists, let's see, the last biographies, especially, let's say, for women biographies. Also, these start to be helpful for saying, uh, to have some checks. Let's see problems with Wikidata. Sometimes there are some vandalism. People change gender to change some instances and all these. So you could, uh, you could uh, find it out. In this case, as far as it was linked to Catalan Wikipedia, it was the target one. And also, as I commend you to, to see three different things uh, regarding the templates about some biographies. No? And also something that I still haven't studied enough is uh, about the editing pattern. No? Depending how you see different users might, might react to different uh, things regarding to uh, biographies. Um, and that's it. That I let the uh, next slide from David Semedo. Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you for introducing uh, David. David, are you around? Hello, hello. Yes, I'm here. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Tony, for the kind introduction too. Um, so I'm. I will present the, this work, which is also uh, still in a preliminary stage. But the idea is to uh, have assembled this framework to uh, bring these vision and language understanding models uh, and make them be uh, capable of dealing with open domain data. So in the next slide. Um, I, ha uh, I have here this uh, full framework where, so uh, the idea is that well, current state-of-the-art works uh, like Wilbert and Alex Mert and others, they are really, really good at describing and talking about things that are in the images. It happens that, for example, in these two images, visually, they are some, somewhat similar. They, they, they depict the same visual concept, so it's just wreckage from a natural disaster. Well, uh, in order to really understand what these images are about, we really have to take into account the full context. So the idea is to leverage on this uh, framework, which basically goes from the images that are on Wikimedia uh, to Wikidata, which somehow structures uh, in a knowledge graph um, the several entities uh, for a specific domain. And then we also have the Wikipedia pages that provide us with even further uh, context in the text form. So together, I think this is a, a great uh, framework to be able to uh, in extend these models and uh, allow them to jointly reason over media, the knowledge graph, and the temporal context of information. So this leads us to the next slide, where we propose a set of tasks. Uh, there has, there's much more information in the paper. But just to give you an overview, um, I chose this image, which basically is related to George Floyd protests. So if you look at the image without considering anything else, it's really hard to understand what it is and basically describe it in an accurate manner. So we formulate these tasks. Uh, for example, uh, one, one of tasks, one task that one task that is really uh, already somehow somewhat standard in computer vision community is image captioning. But here we have to uh, describe the image also accounting for extra context information in order to be able to really describe the image. Uh, and the topic that it conveys. And the, the second task is related to uh, conversational agents. So these are becoming predominant across, uh, well, 
as a search uh, search system. So it's, it provides us with a much more natural way to find information through a conversation. And we want to achieve these models that are able to talk about an image, but also from the topics that are mentioned or referred on that image. So this is another type of task. There are others related to linking to social media. And of course, we can also come up with uh, several uh, compelling visualizations that not only uh, show a static um, overview of a topic that uh, but also shows a, a, how a specific topic evolves over time. But of course, to tackle these tasks, we really need a framework. And the, the one we proposed based on Wikimedia projects uh, as all the key in ingredients to address this. We already started working on the first one. So like I said, this is a very preliminary uh, project in its, in its early stages. So if you want, if you're interested in this, please drop a message, reach out to me and um, I will give you more details if you are interested. So thanks. Thanks, Philip, you're next. Yes, I'm here. Hi, I'm Philip. Uh, this, this work is a collaboration between University of Konstanz, Wuppertal and FIZ Karlsruhe. Let me start with our motivation on the first slide, please. Um, for developing mathematical entity linking or wikification of mathematical formulae. Wikipedia provides special pages which open if you click on a linked formula, a name and description of the concept is shown along with names and description of the constituting identifiers or the symbols. However, at the moment only a handful of formula are linked, so we need scalable methods to do this. The second application or motivation is a mathematical question answering system, which we build for questions on Wikidata. The system can answer relationship questions such as what is the relation between mass and energy to display names for variables and values for constants retrieved from Wikidata and allow for calculations. Next slide, please. So to develop scalable methods to link formula concepts in Wikipedia articles to Wikidata items, we set up this pipeline, which we can see on the left. First, Wikipedia articles are annotated using our Anomath Tech Formula and Identifier Annotation Recommender System, which is the contribution of this paper. And uh, second, the annotated concepts are seeded as Wikidata items. Third, links are included in the annotated articles. We evaluated both our annotation recommendation approach and the community acceptance of the edits in Wikipedia and Wikidata. On the top right corner, you can see the start screen of Anomath Tech, which is hosted by Wikimedia at anomathtech.wmflabs.org. You can watch the demo video. I will paste the link later. Um, at the bottom left, you can see your, the, the annotation recommendations that are displayed after clicking on a formula in the Wikipedia article that is about to be annotated. Using the AI assistance, we were able to speed up the annotation process by a factor of 1.4 for formulae and 2.4 for identifiers. The community rejected 33% of the Wikidata items and only 12% of the edited Wikipedia articles within the first month. We persisted the data set into a benchmark platform for mathematical formulae. In future project, we will evaluate mathematical information retrieval tasks and systems on this labeled data benchmark. I'm looking forward to meeting you in the virtual poster session later. And now we'll hand over to John Samuel. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, first and foremost, I'm thankful to the organizers for allowing me to present this talk for Wiki Workshop 2021. I'm John Samuel, and my presentation is about Sheck statements. In the next slide, I will present the main motivation behind this work. Uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, the, thanks to the uh, open and collaborative nature of Wikidata, new item entities are created regularly and they need to be validated. Wiki projects play a significant role in guiding the contributors and newcomers to various possible ways for describing entities. But how can errors like wrong use of properties, cardinalities, or data types be identified? Wikidata property constraints can identify some of them. Uh, and the recently introduced shape expressions or checks for describing entity schemas can be used to identify many more complex errors. However, at the time of speaking, there exist only less than 300 entity schemas for more than 90 million Wikidata items. So this work started during uh, Wikitech Storm 2019 in Amsterdam, aimed to reduce the complexity of writing entity schemas or shape expression. The major question was, is it possible to generate shape expressions from simple CSV statements or file? 
Secondly, it must take into consideration the work done by numerous wiki projects. And thirdly, the solution should be multilingual and it should help speakers from multiple languages. So Sheck statements was inspired by quick statements and it supports a simple tabular column uh, syntax with five columns. Two parts, you have a uh, first part for specifying the press pixels and the second part for specifying the shape of entities. So in the second part, you can specify node names, properties, allowed values, uh, cardinalities and comments. And you can have, and I will share the link, it's available at checkstatements.toolforge.org. In the next slide, I will give a simple example of a TV series and the a five column uh, syntax. So you, as we see, there's a TV series in, uh, an instance of uh, uh, Q5398426, and it can have one or more, sorry, zero or more zenures, and you can ha have one or more countries of origin or uh, uh, one or more directors or one or more screenwriters. But at the last line, you see an interesting example where you say, what is a gener? And this gener could be uh, could have multiple values. So here you see the vertical bars and commas being used to explain things. Thank you once again, and see you in uh, room two knowledge craft session. Thank you. Thank you, John. Christian, you're closing the first part of the show. Hi, thank you, Miriam. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I'm to be present uh, our work on Wikipedia editor drop off. Um, there is a extensive literature about uh, how a newbie uh, starts to participate in Wikipedia and how sometimes they leave the project very early. And there is also literature on editor retention in general, but uh, we think that there is uh, less uh, uh, study about uh, how experienced editors uh, leave uh, the project. So uh, we started this uh, project uh, with a grant uh, from uh, the Wikimedia Foundation uh, to find out what are the causes of uh, uh, editor drop-off. So in the next slide. So the first thing to say is that there is no uh, widely accepted definition for drop-off. So we started by uh, characterizing various uh, states uh, of uh, drop-off uh, using community documentation, such as uh, essays, on various uh, Wikipedia um, language editions. And we see that, for example, there are uh, wiki breaks, uh, semi-retirement and retirement that are uh, different uh, states in which an editor can be through their life cycle. And uh, uh, there are uh, a shared definition about what this state uh, in entail. In particular, in the uh, paper, we collected this information and uh, uh, from various languages, and also we present uh, a characterization that uh, is uh, based on activity or better inactivity metrics that could uh, be based on uh, fixed uh, thresholds. For example, uh, from how many uh, for for how many days a person did not uh, uh, edit Wikipedia. But uh, we are interested in expanding this, uh, taking account uh, also several characteristics of the user, for example, if uh, they have uh, an admin flag or not, because uh, there are some uh, inactivity period in uh, uh, Wikipedia policies in various languages that says that if an administrator is not active for a certain amount of days, then uh, they will lose their uh, admin flag. So next slide. So uh, together with this uh, uh, characterization of drop-off, we also want to study which uh, on wiki interaction that we can observe from the edit history can be associated to drop-off. And uh, we have uh, uh, identified these three families of hypotheses that you see. One, um, uh, also uh, taking into consideration the existing literature. So one could be caused uh, from abrupt interactions or conflict between the editors, the other from an excess in a number or the spread of interaction. So uh, for example, burnout. And third, uh, from a lack of interaction with editors with similar characteristics. So let's say a feeling of isolation. Of course, this uh, work is a kind of a position paper that uh, contextualizes our work and the work that we are going to do in our project and the metric that we are going to compute. We think that is very important to understand the drop-off uh, to uh, uh, 
for, for community health in general, and uh, we welcome your feedback uh, in this topic, and we invite you to participate in the community's perspective poster session in room one. So thank you, everybody. And now it's the break, I think.